Back in 2006, a man stormed into a high school, took hostages, and systematically abused them for hours. But for some reason, this received very little media attention and was basically swept under the rug. Let's look into it. At 8.42 a.m. on September 27, 2006, a strange man pulled up to the Platte Canyon High School in Bailey, Colorado. Two minutes later at 8.44, the Jeep left again. But at 8.46, the Jeep once more pulled up into a new parking spot. Eleven minutes later, it would leave again. When you see someone scoping out a school, you immediately start feeling that something is suspicious. This was just a few years after Columbine, in a city only about 45 minutes away. People were, generally, still on high alert, as the memory was fresh in their minds. But, somehow, nobody seemed to pay much mind to this suspicious behavior. Roughly an hour later at 9.44, the Jeep returned to the same spot. Some students reported that they witnessed a 50-something man sitting in a yellow Jeep in the school parking lot at around 10.45 a.m. Videos taken from security cameras outside show that the man was in his Jeep for at least 20 minutes, mingling with students as classes changed. The man had spoken to a male high school student and, quote, asked about the identity of a list of female students. An hour later, at 10.43, according to the police, the man would exit the car. In one more hour, at 11.40 a.m., the man entered the school. He was wearing a black hoodie, carrying a Glock 22 pistol, a Smith & Wesson 357 revolver, and a camo print backpack. A 16-year-old student reportedly saw the man entering the high school before the time specified by the police. She stated that she had been walking past a vacant classroom and saw a man inside wearing a hoodie, seemingly very angry. Although she found it weird, she didn't report it to anyone at the school. The weird man wandered around the school for a while until he entered a classroom on the second floor, room 206, where a teacher named Sandra Smith taught honors English, about 20 minutes before lunch would start. When Mrs. Smith asked him what he was doing in her classroom, they began to argue giving students the idea that he was a disgruntled parent. The man walked to the back of the classroom and sat a backpack down on the table while he continued arguing with Mrs. Smith. It all seemed very odd, but not necessarily physically threatening. Until the man pulled out a handgun, that is, and ordered all the students to the front of the room to face the blackboard. Understandably terrified, they complied with his orders. Mrs. Smith, however, he ordered not. Mrs. Smith, all of the male students, and some of the female students to leave the classroom. She told the man that she was in charge of the students and couldn't leave without all of them. He lifted his handgun and aimed it towards her. He threatened to hurt the students if she didn't comply, saying, if you don't want to be hurt, just do what I tell you. They all then left the classroom. Now in the hallway, they stood stunned. Morrison fired one shot into the air, snapping them all back into reality. They all ran to the front office of the school, telling the office worker that a crazy man with a gun had taken over the classroom. He set a backpack down on the back desk. Uh -huh. I went back and approached him because I didn't recognize him. I asked, asked him what I could help him with. Mm -hmm. And he pulled a gun. You know, kind out. of gun, handgun? It's a handgun. He yelled. He said, all of you kids go to the front of the room and face the blackboard. Uh -huh. And they did. And I didn't. And he pointed the gun at me and said, you know, if you don't want to be hurt, just do what I tell you. He said, get out. And if anybody comes back in this room, I have enough explosives in this bag to blow up this school. The school went into lockdown as the office worker called the police. Uh, this is Carol at Platte Canyon. We've got a, somebody with a gun. It's a stranger. Walked in the room with a gun. Not a student. student. Room 206. Upstairs. You got a backpack. It's a backpack. Are all the kids out of the school? No, we're in lockdown. <laughs> Once the shot was fired and the school went into lockdown, rumors began spreading and information began coming out. The parents of one of the hostages, Emily Keyes, were notified that shots had been fired inside room 206 at their daughter's high school. Her father quickly got online to check his daughter's class schedule and then went into shock. It was her classroom. 
The parents were in a state of disbelief and went into a bit of denial, thinking that she may not necessarily have been in there at the time. Her father drove down to the school but was forced to park a ways away. Her mother went down to the police station where she was informed that her daughter was indeed a hostage. Her father, upon hearing this, found someone to text his daughter. Within a few minutes, they got one message back, saying simply, I love you guys. He responded, where are you? But got no response. The intruder turned off all the lights in the classroom and repositioned his bag to the middle of the room, telling the students not to touch it as it might explode. He then ordered them all back to the front of the room to face the blackboard once more, all while waving his gun around, carelessly pointing it towards each of the students, terrifying them even more in the process. Once alone with the female students, the man began asking them one by one to come to the back of the classroom as the others were forced to stay facing the blackboard. The girls facing the front of the room were forced to listen in horror as, one by one, they heard zippers being undone, belts being removed, and clothes being ripped. They heard each girl in the back of the room sobbing, begging Morrison to stop. He would then put his gun to their neck and threaten to kill them if they didn't comply. It was obvious what was happening to them, even though they couldn't see it, and they had to stand and wait for what they knew was, inevitably, soon coming to them as well. Systematically, the man had been taking each girl to the back of the classroom and molesting them. It hasn't been said to what degree of assault he did. However, suffice to say that each of the girls were left traumatized. Once he had his fill of one of the hostages, he released her at around 12.15 p.m. She was escorted out of the building where she, in a panic, explained what was going on inside the classroom. Not understanding the situation and somehow seemingly unaware of the lockdown, a few unrelated students attempted to enter the classroom as normal. Furious, the man fired a shot to scare them off. He continued to fly into random fits of rage before suddenly returning back to normal, all while carelessly swinging his gun around toward the girls. It was very apparent that he was out of his mind. The man's name was Dwayne Morrison, a dirty drifter living out of his car who had seemingly zero connection to the school or even the town itself. He was unemployed, homeless, and hadn't been in contact with anyone who knew him for almost a year. Cops arrived on the scene as fast as they possibly could, the memory of Columbine still fresh on their minds. They did not want a repeat of that incident. Instead of waiting outside the school, as the police on Columbine infamously did, they went straight inside and began scoping out the scene. From locked classrooms, teachers would pass green cards under the doors, notifying the police that they were okay and the intruder was not with them, all part of their training. Moving past the green card classrooms, the police were determined to go directly toward the intruder and confront them head on. Police finally arrived at the classroom, where they saw Morrison holding one student in front of him as a human shield as he held a gun in his other hand. He was backed into a corner in this classroom with nowhere to flee. He kept his hostages close and threatened the cops, claiming that he had three pounds of C4 in his backpack, saying, think what that would do to the school. Police momentarily backed off and called in the bomb squad. Having the criminal backed into a corner, the police decided it was now time to evacuate all the people in the other classrooms. Going room to room, they started letting teachers and students out, who fled in a somewhat uniform fashion. After pleading and negotiation from the police, Morrison gradually released five of the eight girls he held hostage in the room, only after sexually assaulting them. Each time he released a hostage from his arm, he would simply take another. Feeling that this was well beyond their means, police requested a SWAT team to come up to the scene. Given that they were not close, the SWAT team didn't arrive until about 1.30 p.m. They piled up against the wall outside the classroom, attempting to negotiate with the criminal, as he still held hostages. With negotiations going absolutely nowhere, 
and Morrison, for the most part, refusing to comply, police started setting explosive charges around the door in order to blow it off the hinges and gain entry. Snipers were positioned nearby, but the lack of light and approaching nightfall convinced them that they wouldn't be able to contribute much. Only one officer was able to see into the classroom, using a small mirror to peer inside. Morrison was still backed into a corner in the back of the classroom, looking forward with two hostages in hand. The hostage negotiator on scene attempted to communicate with Morrison, but with very little luck. Most of his communication consisted of telling the cops to back off or to leave him alone. She tried everything she could to get something out of him, trying both a calm and rational approach and a more hardline approach, but she unfortunately came up with nothing. Morrison didn't want anything out of this. He seemingly came into this school knowing that he wouldn't make it out alive. Police attempted to insert a small fiber optic camera into the classroom by sliding it under the door. However, the lack of light made it virtually useless. It did, however, succeed in sending Morrison into a violent rage when he demanded they remove it immediately. The panic of the hostages at his rage was heard clearly by the police outside. Morrison ordered the one hostage he had mainly been using to communicate, Emily Keyes, to tell the police that the ordeal would be over at 4 p.m., so the officers would just have to wait until then. Hearing this, officers feared that this was the time he set his explosives to detonate, knowing very well that disarming such a device would take longer than the amount of time they had. All parties agreed that it was time to intervene with force. At 3.35 p.m., the charges on the door were detonated and the police breached the room. Flashbangs were thrown in order to distract Morrison as officers took aim at him. The charges, the breach, the flashbang, everything had worked perfectly as they had planned and practiced. What they couldn't control, however, was how Morrison would react. They quickly saw that he was positioned against the back wall with one hostage, Emily Keys. He had her head in his left hand, with his gun in his right, placed against her temple. Only a portion of his head was visible to officers. The one other hostage was able to flee and was caught by a SWAT team member who escorted her to safety. The SWAT officers advanced towards Morrison when he raised his gun. This is where all hell broke loose. Emily Keyes took a step forward, attempting to flee. Morrison shot her in the right side of her head. At the same time, SWAT officers opened fire on him with a flurry of bullets. One bullet grazed his hand, two others hit him in the right shoulder, and one more hit him in his head. As he was taking this damage, he raised his gun to his right temple and shot himself in the head with one final, fatal blow. This all occurred within a matter of seconds. Police officers knew that Emily was done for. People simply don't survive injuries like that. However, regardless, they stayed with her and assured her that the ordeal was over and that everything was going to be okay. She was airlifted to the hospital, but she simply wasn't able to be saved. She was pronounced dead by 4.32 p.m. Was there an instant that you thought, she's okay? No. You knew? I knew. No. By 4.34 p.m., officers were conducting a sweep of the school, looking for explosives. However, they couldn't find any. There weren't any. Inside his backpack, however, was a stash of equipment. This included duct tape, handcuffs, knives, a stun gun, rope, scissors, and numerous rounds of ammunition. However, that wasn't all. The remaining contents were much darker and showed what his intentions were from the beginning. The further contents of the bag were massage oil, a dildo, and a vibrator. Morrison's body was searched, turning up zero explosives. The rest of the school was searched, revealing no explosive devices at all. By 6.15, the sweep was complete. 
CCTV footage from the school revealed that, the day before, Morrison had been driving around the school, scoping out the place. The next day, in the mail, Morrison's family received a suicide letter. In this letter, he spoke of his constant abuse at the hands of his father, and the deep depression he had felt ever since. He said that his father was constantly screaming and yelling, and that school was his only refuge. He further informed them that he had been having suicidal thoughts ever since he was 21 years old, and that a fishing trip with his brother was his only good memory. He then told them how to divide up his property, specifically leaving his few remaining guns to his nephew. The letter didn't speak of anything that he was going to do at the school, only speaking of his planned suicide. He apologized to his brothers and sisters for what he was going to do, asking them not to feel guilty about any of this. They may not have felt guilt, but I imagine they felt a great, great deal of shame. The brother who received the letter couldn't even bear to read it, and instead handed it over to some ATF agents. Morrison didn't appear to have any prior grudges against the high school, oddly enough. He did, however, have a long, ongoing feud with a motorcycle shop in Littleton, Colorado, the very town in which Columbine took place. He had bought a motorcycle from this shop and was disappointed that a number of extra accessories weren't included. He was extremely enraged by this, the flames of which were further stoked when the shop sent him a catalog full of ads for accessories in the mail. Feeling the catalog was intended to offend him, he left a ranting voicemail to the shop, stating, What do you think it will take to get this stopped? Uh, maybe, uh, maybe a visit with an assault rifle? This occurred one month before the incident at the high school. After, he was arrested and pled guilty to charges of harassment. He directly blamed this incident for what he did. While dealing with the items left throughout the crime scene, police eventually came across the belongings of Emily Keyes. Within her wallet, they found a business card for the very same Harley-Davidson store that Morrison hated so much. When contacting the store, employees reported that at least 250 copies of that same business card had been handed out over time. Given that Emily did not own a motorcycle, had not been shopping for one, and that the employees did not remember her, and that her family and friends had zero recollection of her ever going there, police suspected that Morrison had planted the car there at some point during the crisis. He would have had ample time to place the card there. It almost seems like this was his way of punishing the motorcycle shop for what he did. However, nobody really bought it, and it didn't work. Understandably, the school closed for the rest of the week after this incident, and numerous memorials were erected along the highway near the school. Thousands of motorcycles rode from Columbine to Platte Canyon in honor of victims of school violence. The school reopened the next Monday, with counseling stations set up for the students. Some students began the day while praying outside that morning. Out of the 460 students that had attended the school, only 10 were absent that day. It was later found that efforts to increase funding for school security since Columbine were largely blocked in favor of increasing efforts to get higher test scores. A representative from the University of Colorado stated that the school districts had become so obsessed with standardized testing and academic requirements that they hadn't been spending much time on the issue. Emily Key's parents started the I Love You Guys Foundation led by survivors, family members, and first responders that aims to increase safety and preparedness within schools. They focus on training in school and community safety programs, as well as the reunification of families. So far, the programs have been used entirely for free by over 30,000 schools, agencies, and organizations throughout the U.S., Canada, and several other countries. The victims have gone on to live their lives, but the trauma from this incident will continue to linger in their minds. Morrison, who knew what abuse does to a person, 
chose to inflict this same pain on others. He ironically took a school, his only refuge, and twisted it into a traumatic, horrific memory for others. He was a truly miserable person who only desired to spread his misery to others, a cancer upon society. However, he is dead, and all but one of his victims will live on. In the name of Emily Keyes, the one who sadly lost her life, further tragedies will be avoided in the future. One of the hostages, Samantha Schuler, no longer feels that she is a victim. She now works as a teacher herself, a teacher who has to repeatedly witness more and more school shootings in the news. It doesn't really seem like it'll be stopping anytime soon. Once again, thank you for watching my video. It really surprised me how little attention this case got despite being as horrific as it is. You've probably noticed that things look a little different now. I got sound thingies. I got chair. Just something to, uh, I don't know, make things look a little different. That and I don't start sweating like a pig after standing for two hours recording dialogue over and over and over. So once again, if you found it interesting, a like would be really appreciated. It seems to help things appear in the search results. And if you like hearing about kind of lesser known crimes like this, go ahead and subscribe because uh, it's what I do. Thanks again. Have a good night.